one of the greatest men to ever grace the Scottish rugby scene and to have played so many times for Scotland. He was saying earlier on that uh, many of his inspirational figures are around this room. I'm delighted to welcome and ask you to welcome to the outstanding Ian Milne. Thank you, Rory. I feel a bit like a bear in a lion's den here today. That's the most nervous I've ever been coming to the Mansfield Park. It's a privilege and an honour to be amongst such great players and their families, and it really does mean a lot to me. And I feel honoured to be here. And I've enjoyed the evening as I do every time I come down to the borders. And this one will never change. I'll remember, remember my memory. What I can say, like Colin Telfer, and like Niels Drysdale, I've not been very well this week, but I've made it. <laughs> <laughs> I was at the hospital on Monday, and I've been diagnosed with necrotizing facetitis. A lot of blank looks amongst the Hoyt crowd here. It's a fatal flesh-eating disease, and I've been given 20 years to live. <laughs> My brother walks in, he says, are you all right, Ian? I said, I'm not bad. He looked ashen-faced himself. I said, Kenny, you're not looking well. What's wrong with you? And the news only gets worse. He said, I've got the big C. I said, oh, Kenny. He said, yeah, I've been diagnosed with dyslexia. <laughs> And the week it gets worse. Yesterday, I'm in a supermarket and the phone goes again and I look at Rory Bannerman for the 20th time this week. <laughs> the phone goes peep, peep, peep. Two young boys further up the aisle said, watch out, the big fat bastard's reversing. <laughs> <laughs> To compound insult with injury, a lady comes to the door of my house this morning. She says, I'm collecting clothes for the starving in Africa. And I took one look at her and I said, they can't be that starving if they want my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> but what pleasure to come down to the borders. I always feel the borders is after you've gone through gala. Um, <laughs> I notice they're calling themselves the Las Vegas of Scotland. Like Las Vegas, you can get a lady of the night for a few chips. <laughs> but it's a humour, and I'll go on to a game I played at Selkirk. And it was, a, it was a, one of these, you know, the old days when you played an international, then a club game, an international. My brother Kenny had been dropped for his bad throwing in at the International. And he's about to throw in, and the Selkirk hooker turns round and says, it's going to the middle, it's going to the middle. And some wag in the crowd said, how do you know he doesn't ken where it's going? <laughs> <laughs> and you also learn about the Hoyt fighting spirit, or sorry, the border fighting spirit. And this is why I've loved coming down here. It's a true story, playing at Jed. I scored the first try, we're four nothing up. Brother David scores the second try, we're eight nothing up after 10 minutes. And I turned round to the cop at Jed and said, there's only 13 more of us left to score a try. We lost 15-8 that day. <laughs> 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 but it's, it, it's a connection, a strong connection with Heriots and Hoyk that gives me such a privilege to, privilege to be here. Some of you may not be aware, but the, the opening game in this, um, September, third week of September, goes back to just the turn of the century. Hoyk were the guests at Golden Acre when we opened the stand in 1926. A Hoyk's Heriot game was the first club game ever to be televised by STV. The connection of the two clubs is great. I do remember one of the um, September games, and it's a fond one. Jim will remember it. Heriots were quite strong that day. It was in sometime in the 70s. 
and one or two of the Hoyt players were coming to the end of their careers. I think Jim came off injured. And the thing was, my father was a doctor. My father had no interest in rugby until his three boys started playing. And it was the first time he'd seen Hoyt playing. He'd heard about them. Jim comes off injured. Then Colin Telfer comes off injured. Now, Colin at this stage was a slightly portly old gentleman. And my dad said, after the match, he said, the standoff came in. He was fatter than you, Ian. <laughs> and the third man who came off was Norman Pender. <laughs> he had a knee injury. My dad said, I couldn't even find his knee. <laughs> but I owe Colin, he's not here tonight, but a lot of gratitude and thanks. And it's a true story of one of my earlier games for Scotland. I was never the best behaved man on tour. As a youngster, I had this, as already mentioned, the sort of thing I felt like taking my clothes off, and there I am sitting in the middle of the hotel in Paris, bollock naked, sorry ladies. I was about to be reprimanded, I could see also disciplined by the SRU committee at the time. Colin, the gentleman that he was, came over, took all his clothes off and sat down next to me in the bar. And I think at that stage he rescued my career and put his own neck in the line. But I've known Colin a long time because I meet him socially in Edinburgh. And what I didn't realise, what a remarkable man he was in the Seventh Circuit in the mid 60s, winning 10 tournaments in a row. You know, lots have been mentioned about the team. What an incredible achievement for the club. I think three players played in all 10 tournaments. And I've, all the years I've known Colin, he's never mentioned that to me. So, what a wonderful achievement. It was just a shame that the 11th one was Hoyk they lost the tournament on, but 10 in a row, something the club can be proud of. <laughs> I think it was 1976, if I remember correctly, or it might have been 77, and Harriet's lost 69-6. Norman Pender scored two tries, but I, I never gave up that game. It taught me just never to give up. The Hoyt pack that day read Pender, Deans, Webb, Tomes, Barnes, McLeod, Davis and Hegarty. And as a youngster, I'd go out thinking, we've always got a chance. That was my attitude. And then I looked at our pack back. I didn't look at it then, but I thought back and I looked at it. We had a dentist at Loosehead Prop who didn't want to get a finger broken, so we wouldn't touch the ball. We had a pastry chef at Hooker. <laughs> with a chap in the second row who was more interested in his good looks than playing rugby, <laughs> with a bat row boy who just loved playing sevens. And I realised why Harriet's at that stage were not at the races, and how we had to change it. But I, came, I, came, I moved from a boy that day to a man, and I got a real lesson from the Hoyt green machine, or as I called it, the threshing machine that day. And it just made me determined, as I think is also, is down in the hoik attitude, never give up and just get better. The front row battles I had were immense. The Pender, Deans and Webb battles I'll never forget. I learnt my trade then. It also brought back memories when I've, we scrummaged and scrummaged and scrummaged at Golden Acre just to take on the men of hoik. That's how much you meant to us. And the day we beat you was something I'll never forget and was the greatest game of my life. Only once. <laughs> and then we went to the front row that followed after that with Terence Froud, Colin Deans and Jock Ray. I enjoyed every time of it, every moment of it, because I enjoyed playing down here. If only Terence had learned to give way instead of resisting the shove, he would not have been the shape he is now. <laughs> But a true story, at our club dinner earlier on this year, we had a Q&A, um, Ken Scotland, British Lions colleague of Hugh McLeod, Andy Irvin, myself and my brother Kenny. And John Beatty was the compare and he asked the question, what was the, what was the best game you ever played in? And three out of the four of us picked a Hoyt game. Each one of it was a different game, but testament to your club, Three out of the four people up there picked a Hoyt game. It was the most influential in their career.
Colin Deans here tonight, 40 caps with him. The second best hooker I've ever played with. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to go on about the best, I'm afraid. Some of you may be aware there were three of us played for Scotland, three brothers. Myself, 44 caps. My youngest brother, Kenny, 39. And David, who got one cap. 10 minutes against Japan in the World Cup. <laughs> it's always interesting being in David's company. He's one of three brothers who played 80 times for Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> we get all well as a family, and he does suffer the, suffer the brunt of our jokes. Many years ago, we got a special jersey made, which is numbered one, two, and three, two arms, three necks. And we do some charity walks in it and stuff like that. And I remember one of the walks we were on, we were into it in about 20 minutes. And I turned around to David and said, you must be feeling very emotional. He said, why, big brother? I said, it's the longest you've ever been in a Scotland jersey. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got fond memories again, centenary season. Um, I was captain then in 1990. And we're playing against um, Edinburgh Aquis, as it was at the time. And their front row read Dory Rowan, John Allen and David Soule. And the Harriet front row was Milne, Milne and Milne. Um, David Soule, Grand Slam captain, great player, but did not like playing against me. I was about 10 stone heavier than him at the time. And the first scrum went down and it collapsed. And Ray Megson, the referee, penalty against Harriet's number three for collapsing it. I looked at him quizzically, like now they get it wrong sometimes, I thought. <laughs> the next scrum happens, it goes down. Pelt against Harriet's number three, collapsing again. I looked at Ray Megson, I said, you must be joking. He marches me back 10 yards, arguing with the referee. We've got a scrum five yards from Naki's line, we're pushing them over, Sol, Rowan and Alan going backwards. Penalty against the Harriet's number three. And repeated offence, you'll go off next time. And I turned around and said, Ray, it's him, it's David Soul, he can't hold me up. He's just going backwards all the time. I said, if I call you a bastard, what are you going to say? I'm going to send you off here, Ian. I said, what if I think you're one? He said, Ian, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> I said, Ray, I think you're a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but my first game for Scotland, and Colin was a part of it, 1979 against Ireland, 13 games, we'd, gone, uh, um, we'd lost 13 in a row, and actually it was a momentous game, and I'll tell you the build up earlier on, but that game we drew 11 all, and I touched the ball, it was only one of two times I ever touched the ball playing for Scotland, <laughs> and I think that was a pass. I gave to Colin, who gave to Keith Robertson, who ran in and scored a try, and we drew 11 all, oh, Colin, is that correct? Well, I remember it, because I didn't touch the ball very often. <laughs> but people often wonder, I started in 79 and carried on to 91, and they said, how proud you must have been to play for the jersey. And of course, I was, Scotland meant everything to me. But there was more to playing rugby than that. I was a young student when I first got picked, completely out of the blue, never played for the B team, got thrust, um, sort of brought into the limelight, first cap. And I just remember turning up on a Thursday to the Braids Hotel, which is a wonderful place to go. None of your dry tree stuff there, Stuart. We started off with prawn cocktail, sole goujon, fillet steak, pudding, cheese and biscuits, and a bottle of wine. <laughs> I'm a poor student, and I thought, how wonderful is this life? Can it get any better? Friday was the same. I think the weight in the programme went from 16.4 up to about 18 stone over two days. <laughs> but I thought, what a wonderful occasion. And then, of course, as I mentioned, we drew 11 all. And in these days, if you won, you got champagne. If you lost, you got beer. We drew, we'd broken the duck of 13 losing games in a row. We got champagne. I'd never tasted champagne before. I thought, what a wonderful life this is playing for Scotland. Can it get any better? Well, it did. 
those days, the dinner dance after the dinner, I met the Irish winger and he said to me, Ian, have you got a partner? I didn't have a partner in these days. I wasn't as good looking as I am now. <laughs> and, and he said, my wife's friend would like to come in. And this is a true story. And I went out to look for her, couldn't find her, came back in, she said, come on, come with me. I came out and there was this gorgeous blonde headed girl there with sort of red tight Velcro trousers on that were fashionable in the 70s. And I was uh, walking across the dance floor. She said to me, and you enjoy yourself tonight, have a drink with all your mates, and at the e when the evening finishes, I will look after you the whole evening. She was true to her word. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my first cap. That's why I played another 34 times for Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> the second game that Colin played a part in, it was a, a more serious one, 1984. We'd won the Grand Slam, we played Australia in the autumn. Australian Grand Slam team. It was a part of a series to see and a part of a joke. But I don't know if some of you may remember, they used to show a TV footage of David Campese running half the length of the pitch with John Beattie chasing after him. I was the person who gave David Campese the ball if you run the tape <laughs> further back. <laughs> but the man over there meant so much to me. That day, Gregor McKenzie got his first cap myself and Colin in the front row. Very few will remember it, but the Australians, they won the Grand Slam that year. They destroyed every home nation scrum there was. And people asked me what the greatest game I ever played in, and that was it. Their front row was McIntyre, Lawton, and Rodriguez. Immensely powerful and huge. But I remember, we took the ball scrum so low, they couldn't shift us that day. Lawton couldn't move his feet. And if we had just a bit more push from Toomba from behind, <laughs> would have won a few against the head. But that was my own little game. I played myself that day. And I remember speaking to Rodriguez and Lawton afterwards. And they just, they, if you watch the TV, they go away, the two of them, at half time. They actually forgot what half the pitch they were going to. They were in so much disarray in the scrum. We lost 33-9, but I took it as a moral victory. <laughs> the Lions tour column was in, we all know, 83. I saw the character of the real man, how he trained every day that, um, that tour. Didn't get in the test team, knew it was unlikely he was going to get in because Kieran Fitzgerald. And that's when you could see the hoik in him coming through. I'll train every day. I trained with him as well and got as fit as I'd ever been. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, that's it. I'm going to tell another story, which I wasn't going to mention then. <laughs> The West Coast. I wasn't going to mention it, but never mind. <laughs> the two boys are here, but don't worry about it. it showed, this is to show how communications has changed in the world these days. We're in the West Coast of the South Island, and we're playing midweek rugby, and Greymouth, we won the game easily. Colin, I think, scored a try, took seven or eight against the head, and went out celebrating as one did in these days. And a few pints, life gets a bit boring. So I thought, wouldn't it be fun if we got everyone's shirt and ripped all the buttons off? I'm not proud of it now, but it happened then. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but it got worse. We got bored with shirts, so we moved on to V-neck sweaters. And everyone in the crowd had lost their V-neck sweaters by the end of it. But the real crowning glory was when the mayor came through the street and we grabbed the side of his blazer and we tore it in half. <laughs> now, there'd been a warning before that, the next people who misbehave will go home in the next flight. I rushed back up to the bedroom. When you're on tour and you've had a few to drink, there's a sixth sense tells you you've gone too far, like the police sirens that were going at the time. <laughs> I got up to my room, went to bed, pretending to be asleep, Willie John McBride, bear, you've caused havoc, there's police that are right downstairs, I pretended to be asleep. Eventually crashed through the door. I said, what is it, Willie? He said, you've caused trouble down there. The mayor's lost his blazer. There's police and everything. I said, I don't know what you're talking about, Willie. I've been lying in bed, sleeping. We've got a big training session the next day. I could see the doubt come over his mind. Anyway, we got a lecture the next day, but nothing happened. Two days later, the Sun newspaper arrives in New Zealand. Centre spade spread with the bear 
holding the mayor's blazer. <laughs> I've obviously learned a lot about the club. I've read a few bits and pieces. Some heroes I never knew about. Wattie Sutherland, Jock Beatty, Dave Valentine. But some of you and I feel embarrassed almost to be here tonight. But there's a man in this audience, I remember as a youngster sitting at Murrayfield and there was two players' records fascinated me. One was Dave Roloff, Howe Fife, and the other, this gentleman over there, Hugh McLeod, 40 caps in a row for Scotland. And for some reason, as an 11-year-old boy, these figures just stuck in my mind. How could these men have played 40 times when everyone else had played 20 or 30 at the maximum? And I don't know you that well, Hugh, but what an incredible record you've had. Two Lions trips, six tests in a row, retired at 29. A real legend of the game of rugby and a hero and inspiration to me when I was an 11-year-old boy. It was a pleasure about it. Hugh. I've actually been touched by so many players in the Hoik our, our, um, club, some who are sadly not with us. Adam Robson, who was president of the 84 Grand Slam team. What a gentleman and a true stalwart of rugby. A great barbarian. I loved the barbarians, believe it or not. And what a wonderful gentleman you had coming from this club. Robin Redwine Charters. <laughs> yeah. Reed, sorry, Reed. I'm from Edinburgh, Reed. And he actually was selected for my whole career. And he actually took me under his wing when I was a youngster and just said, keep going, don't worry about it. My second game was against Sholly. He said, don't worry about it. It was all right for him drinking his red wine saying that. <laughs> but one immense character. There's another gentleman here. And I may, I may, it may be wrong, but... I played against, I think it was the Lynn Dean Heriots used to play in Hogmanay, in the first, sorry, on New Year's Day, the first trades, was it, sorry, my apologies, and I played for the trades, an 18-year-old boy got exceedingly drunk, and I was through in the clubhouse, and I remember to this day, this gentleman walked through with a tray full of beers, I took one up, drunk it in one, and put it back down in his tray, and he couldn't do anything about it. I was told at the time it was the great Norman Sudden, I didn't know you then, Norman, but I believe it couldn't have been him because he never buys around. <laughs> <laughs> I played with six of the greatest, or played with or against six of the greatest team. I was a president, a chairman of selectors, and also an entertainer, old rat face Rennick. Can you beat him? He's an inspiration on and off the pitch, a rugby brain to match none, humour to match nothing. What a great man to have in your club. We all need a Jim Rennick in our club. <laughs> and finally, my big mate Toomba, who can no longer be with us, or is no longer, who couldn't make it today. God, I hope he's there. <laughs> Our great love was fishing. And a little story back in uh, 1985, we went to Canada touring. And it's just one of the pictures that will always remain in my mind. We got to the hotel in Seattle, and it was on the seaside. You could actually fish from your bedroom window. And I hate to say it, but we were playing a game the next day. But there was Toomba and I with a big plastic bucket filled with ice, full of Budweiser's. The shades were on fishing out the bedroom window, <laughs> three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the preparation was different these days. <laughs> but needless to say, we won the game, which meant so much to us. One of the last players I played in my last game was Tony Stanger, 1990. Um, I, don't, I didn't play in the Grand Slam then, but I came back and played in New Zealand. And probably one of my fondest memories are tinged with a lot of sadness as well. We lost 21-18 to the All Blacks that day, Tony. Probably the best chance we'd ever got beating um, All Blacks then. They'd been undefeated five years in a row. We got done by the referee. 
it was true that day. We did actually penalties by Grant Fox. But pleasure to play at the beginning of one man's career and the end of mine. It was my final test. And the glory he had from that scoring that Grand Slam try will remain in the memory of everyone. Of course, as youngsters now, I watched Rory Hutton, believe it or not, against our under-16s down in one of the parks in Hoyk, ripping our boys apart. Our city boys had never been to the borders before. And after about three minutes, I complained they were cheating, they were kicking, they were biting. <laughs> I said, this is when you start to learn to play rugby boys. They stuck in, but even then, the boy Rory Hutton, who I think is the best back in Premiership rugby at the moment, was outstanding at that age. Stuart, I had great pleasure in watching you on this year. Um, obviously, the manager, Mr Irvin, a very good friend of mine, um, sung your praises. You're at the start of your career. You've come through a great club from a great town. Never forget where you've come from, and I hope you have a tremendous career in playing for the Lions another two or three times. It'd be brilliant. Well done, Stuart. <laughs> Tradition's so important. In Hoyt, you've got it oozing out here. A club like Heriot's, we tend to forget it. We're part of a school which doesn't really concentrate in rugby nowadays. But a lot of us are internationals, typical Scots people, we're modest people. And we actually don't want to say too much about our careers. But I think it's important sometimes we do talk about it because youngsters want to know and actually learn and hear about the stories that have gone in the past. As I said earlier on at our club dinner, we had Andy Irvin and Ken Scotland, myself and Kenny, and we had a lot of the players there. And they had never heard of Ken Scotland, or very few of them had. And they knew Andy, but not as well as probably all of us do in this audience. And by the end of that dinner, they were just so astounded at the, the career of these two men that they just wanted to talk to them. And I think something suddenly for about Heriot's meant a lot more to them. Earlier on this year, I was with the Seven squad. And we stopped in Lauder on the way back from Jed, the last Sevens tournament. I got Chanter's squad and talked about tradition and they wondered about Langham. And I said, in the old days, look well, at my time, is that the old days? It was, a, it was a spring circuit. And I explained to them how the sevens worked. And you could suddenly see a different appreciation of what the border sevens was all about. It's maybe not right. Maybe we could go back and we get the 15s back to the autumn and the spring sevens. But if you speak to these young players, they actually listen and they do appreciate tradition. I think you've got it in oodles down here. It's a, proud, it's a club to be proud of. As I drove in, I noticed the modesty, the modesty of it all, a sign saying Mansfield Park and other playing grounds. I think you should be a bit more proud of your club. And I think there should be a great big sign saying the greatest club rugby ground in Scotland. The Callants of Hoyk have only one dream, to run out to Mansfield in a jersey that's green. Tonight has been a tremendous occasion. Scotland owes your club so much. Don't forget it. Good luck against Stirling tomorrow and success in the Premier Division this year. Thank you. Well, Ian, you've been very much part of a wonderful evening for Hoyk, and as a man from Heriot's, um, of course, great rivalry between the two. A oh, tremendous rivalry, and from very much different backgrounds, but the history of the clubs go back a long, long way, um, pre-1920s, and some tremendous games that I was involved in, and it was my favourite place to come and play. And of course, many great matches, of course, I mean, they can roll off the tongue, all the memories will come flooding back, but just pick one for us. Oh, for me, um, I mentioned one tonight when we got beaten 69-6 in the league, which was a real um, learning lesson for me. And we came back and a couple of seasons later beat them 13-10 at Golden Acre, which has to remain my greatest club game ever. Borders rugby, and Hoyt rugby in particular, as we're, we're obviously here tonight at Mansfield Park, what is it about the culture, the, the, the rugby players that make the Borders so special? Well, I, I think it's the culture, the crowd. There's a lot of wit, there's humour, um, 
the players, I think, play for the jersey, and certainly did in my day. And, and I've watched Hoyk and some of the teams play in the sevens this year, and they play way above what is the level sometimes they should be doing. And it's just a huge commitment, I think, to the club and to the town. And who would you say, as we're talking about the famous 15 and the greatest ever, who was the greatest Hoyk player? Uh, that's a very old answer, but I, if I said my favourite would be Jim Rennick. Um, but, you know, two great colleagues of mine, Colin Deans and Alan Tones, massive figures in the club game of rugby. As I mentioned earlier on in my speech, Hugh McLeod, I used to sit as a youngster and look through the programme and look at his name along with Dave Rowland, these two props who'd got 40 caps, they were an inspiration. Yeah, real achievement that, 40 caps in those days. That exactly, and I used to wonder how these two people used to how they managed it. And to meet the great man today, it was just lovely.